Good afternoon. We're here with the first of our CPD online sessions for the APG Ireland, Britain and the Isles chapter. We hope to start preparing more panel discussions, webinars and whatever you're having yourself where the information is localised to our practice as genealogists and family historians based in Ireland and the United Kingdom. Our first discussion is how to stand out from the crowd developing a personal brand. And taking part today, we have two of the most prominent genealogists in Ireland and the UK, Lorna Maloney and Chris Payton. They're going to compare notes on how they carved out and have managed over a decade to sustain successful careers in family history. Lorna Maloney produces the genealogy radio show on themes of Irish surnames and tracing Irish roots. It airs from Kilkee, County Clare, from Radio Cork of Ashkin. And at this point in time, Lorna has hosted, hosted over 100 shows and they're available as podcasts. I'm going to put the URL up with this pa- online panel discussion. Lorna is also very involved in running the Clans and Surnames Summer School, which has been running since 2013. And many of you may have actually attended it previously in Cork and last year in Tipperary. The Clans and Surnames School is open now for 2018 booking. And likewise, I'm going to put the URL for that up online. Our other speaker, Chris Payton, trained as a graphic designer before moving sideways for 12 years into making documentaries with the BBC and Scottish television. In 2006, he turned to genealogical research as a full-time career option. He holds a postgraduate diploma in genealogical studies from the University of Strathclyde. He's a regular contributor to several UK-based family history publications and author of several family history books, as well as the daily The Genes blog. Chris teaches online Scottish genealogy courses through Faris Teaching and Tutoring and has lectured in Britain, Canada, the US, Australia and New Zealand, as well as in several genealogy cruises with Unlock the Past. And I've met him in the US circuit myself, not unfortunately on a cruise. Chris now lives in the west of Scotland where he runs his Scotland's Greatest Story services. Lorna and Chris, thank you for being our speakers today. My first question, family history is notoriously difficult to make a career out of. You have to be a multitasker, you have to be able to project manage and have good time management skills, as well as basic accounting. Are you both absolutely mad to have settled on this as a career? Um, In many ways, yes, because I wouldn't have realised it had so many dimensions when I moved to it from educational historical projects. I suppose I'm one of the people that fell into it from a strong historical background and um, it did help that I'm I am a qualified project manager manager because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to manage all the different components to professional genealogy. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I basically just made the point that I think it is an absolutely completely mad thing to do for a career. But I like Lorna, I came from another background and um, I was able to bring a few things from that. So it wasn't a complete leap into the dark um, when I did decide to go for it. You know, I had a few other skills I could bring to the party. So I was able to 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 carve my way through from from that as a starting point. Did you actively pursue family history as a career path? Or is it something that you slipped into over time? Yeah, I I think it was actually something I I moved towards. I I used to work at the BBC, um, but I made a conscious decision in about 2005 that I was actually going to quit the BBC. I'd, I'd looked for a long time to find a way out and having developed an interest in family history from about 1999, 2000. Um, I began to consider it as a possibility of something to move into. Um, but it wasn't until I got to about 2005 that I actually had enough confidence to think it's, it's worth a leap into the dark um, and also to finish my previous sort of career within, within television. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was something that I, I didn't quite slip into. I did kind of work towards it. Um, and I got to a point where then there was a leap of faith, really, and, and I kind of took it on from there. That's curious, because many young people would actually work extremely hard, would work very hard to try and get into the BBC. And you're talking about escaping to uh, take a different route. Yeah, I, I have the advantage of having worked at the BBC. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's not quite the glamorous um, setup that a lot of people think it is. There's, um, there's a lot of good things about working in the BBC, not just the BBC, television in general. Um, there is many problems and bureaucracies and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted a bit more control over my own life. Um, and this was a way of trying to continue the same sort of research techniques that I'd used in television production and applying it to something else, because there are actually a lot of similarities between what I used to do within the TV world and in terms of creating a genealogical project, research project for somebody. 
Um, so, as I say, it was something I, I, I began to realize it could be a way out of something that wasn't quite working for me, but which I could bring the skills that I developed there into a, a new sort of area and, and take that forward from there. So, um, yeah, it's it not quite slipped into it, but certainly something that um, I did work towards and then, sort of, as I say, just jumped into it, you know. I hear what you're saying about the BBC. Um, last night on the Channel 4 News, I heard it said that uh, George Orwell learned everything he knew about Big Brother from working in the BBC. Yeah, that, that, that's it. <laughs> Lorna, can you tell us about your first commission as a working genealogist? Uh, my, my my first commission was was quite a small one and it involved a, a family in, in West Clare. And, and uh, I thought it was going to be no problem because I knew the location very, very easily. So I completely... Uh, priced it wrongly and did everything, made every mistake underneath the sun in in data collection. And I learned so much from my first commission. My first commission was a very small one and I was glad I made all my mistakes on it. I would have taken, I thought I knew more than what I did though. And I forgot to apply all my project management and all my other aspects to the first commission that I ever took. Not to get disheartened, but to actually learn. You learn more from your mistakes in your early times than, than what you lose, if you know what I mean. Lorna, can you tell us about your first commission as a working genealogist? Why did you get that commission over someone else? Was it luck? I'm, I'm very well trained and I'm, very, I'm a very good researcher. And I also had the background of looking at something that was genealogically based with the O'Briens and the McNamaras. So I was well used to medieval pedigree work. Well, I wasn't a known authority at the time, but I became one as time went on. And it, co- it kind of went in a parallel path to my, my um, work as a genealogist. Lorna, is it different doing research in the real world, out of the academy? By that, I mean taking on commissioned research. Completely. Um, the two, the two uh, do lend a lot to each other, but they are very different. Par- they're very different universes, you know. And w- one, uh, one project that I worked on, those two worlds met, and that was the George Boole 200, which is an absolutely fabulous project where we celebrated the life of George Boole, the man, the father of modern day computing. And it really joined up all the things in genealogy that I would have... Um, been learning uh, how to apply them into a, a different space for a big project. Chris, you were talking about the fact that you brought your project management skills to research commissions. So you were already used to multitasking, used to doing very many jobs simultaneously in order to finish a job. Is that right? Uh, yeah, to a degree. It wasn't quite just the um, the project management. It was more sort of um, to do with the, the editorial approach as well. And um, the idea that when I, when I used to make TV programs, I would carry out the research and then I'd have to package it in a way um, edit it and then convey a story. So it's similar within the sort of the genealogical approach I have. I, I don't just try and create trees for people. I, I do the harvesting of the information, do the research, and then through the research reports, you, you try to find the narrative and the story. And then through the research report, you end up delivering the final product as opposed to a television program. The, the ultimate story is what you portray in your research report. So there were a lot of parallels in that regard um, in terms of my approach, because I, I, I tend to look at the story and a lot of things that I do, it's, it's what I've always been doing for the last 20 years through TV work and, and things like that, trying to find um, the way of portraying uh, or bringing to life what it is that you find through a few dry facts and, and trying to tell that in a way that makes it um, useful for people to, to, to read and to understand and to appreciate. Um, so that, that was kind of the approach I really brought from sort of BBC towards it. Um, in, in terms of project management, I mean, I, I, I kind of have a, the way things work now, I'm, I'm quite a, a portfolio person I do lots of different things and, and sometimes I will structure my sort of working week and other times I will actually just go with what I feel that I want to do on that day and maybe reschedule things that go along it's, it's one of the benefits of being self-employed as opposed to working within a structure like the BBC is you can actually um, manipulate what you do and how you do it and to fulfill your own sort of um, needs at your own end as well so th- there's there's lots of things I did bring from the BBC but there's lots of things that have evolved since I've become a genealogist in terms of ways of working as well. And I've been kind of finding a feat over the last 10 years as I've moved forward on that. Now that's interesting. Genealogists are like actors. They take time to build a career. In your early career, how easy did you find it to bring in paying commissions? 
Well, one on of the first things I did was I advertised I through an online platform, through an online platform that told me I'd be guaranteed to get lots of work and lots of clients. And, and I was essentially getting one client a month. And each of those clients was generating enough money to pay for the advert, you know. <laughs> so I realized something wasn't quite going right. But when I did start, I had a bit of a safety net behind me. Because when I actually left the BBC, I left on a voluntary redundancy. So I actually had a, a package of money behind me that I could sort of use as a, as a kind of safety net for the first year or two. Um, and so there was a lot of finding on my feet um, at that point, things that did work out, things that didn't work out. And I also went to university. That's when I did my postgraduate course as well, because I thought that would be an investment to try and help sort of professionalize the skills that I'd previously had as a, as a kind of hobby based genealogist. I knew the kind of research approaches that I knew from when I worked in, in television, but there were still things I didn't know about the actual fields of genealogy itself. I knew a lot, but I didn't know everything. I still don't know everything, but it was a good ground to try and progress things along. But as I was at university, I was taking in some commissions um, doing work at the Scotland's People Centre and just basic research for people. But as I began to, to learn more about sort of different areas within genealogy, I then began to um, have more that I could offer to clients in terms of understanding legal aspects of work and, and things like that. But the first couple of years when I got started, it really was hit and miss. I was making all sorts of mistakes. I mean, at one point, I tried creating some data CDs uh, to do with things to do with um, Perthshire and, and sort of um, products. And it was taking as long to produce those as it was to then end up trying to sell them. And then I realized after about a year, it, it just wasn't working out. So I had to keep sort of trial and error on, on a few things. Um, I then began to start writing and, and things then began to pick up because work became a bit more regular and then I began to get a bit more known. Um, and then that affected the client research and so on. So it all began to feed into each other. Um, but they, they do say that when you create a business from scratch, it takes three years to get it up and running. And it certainly was about three years before I felt I really was going down the right track. I made a lot of errors when I started. Um, I got a few things right, though, as well, enough to keep me going. You know. If you were to give one piece of advice to your novice genealogist self, what would that advice be? Lorna, you first. Yeah, um, I would say not to not to give up too soon and not to get disheartened and um, definitely just le keep learning your skill set, keep broadening your skill set and increase your networks and go to talks and learn all the time and make sure you realize nobody ever knows anything about everything and people are experts on their own families and you're not going to be able to supplant some of that knowledge. So it's not a matter of competition. It's a matter of, um, increasing your knowledge and researching all the time and, and, and just kind of having confidence in yourself and not, not becoming afraid of the mistakes that get made because you could be starting from a premise of being given wrong information and you learn how to, one of the things I liked what you said a couple of weeks ago was verify, 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 because it's something that is so true. You learn how to verify all the time. In the early years before you built up a reputation, I find it very interesting that you both refer back to the fact that you made many mistakes when you started out, but you weren't bowed by them. Instead, you looked back at what you'd done wrong and you tried to change, to up your game. That's the real mark of an entrepreneur, someone who's continuously willing to try and to do it better next time, understanding that you never stop learning. How did you differentiate yourself from any other genealogist for hire? Why would a private client or editor want to talk to you before any other genealogist? Well, I suppose because I would have a lot of connections in my local areas and in and that broadened out. And long before I did the genealogy radio show, I was heavily involved in the East Clare Heritage and I was a director of East Clare Heritage. So I had a great deal of knowledge of a particular sphere. And I knew people that had knowledge in other areas that I can direct people onto. So a lot of the work I do today would be I would direct people to other sources and so on and direct people to other genealogists, perhaps. So that is something that um, if I can't do it, I would always pass work on. So people tend to pass work back to me as well. And I also look at space and place. So I do tours and I direct small tours and have and have links, huge links in tourism as well, because genealogy is about networks. It's very much about building them. And especially in a digital age where the world has become a very small place, 
reputation has to be very good and your way of dealing with people has to be strong and it is strong i that is one of my strengths so people have been good to me and i have been good to people and that that counts in this in this world you know chris how would you have differentiated yourself from other genealogists competing for the same work how did you carve out your particular space um i think there's there's a few things in that i mean how, how do i differentiate myself I mean, obviously, as, as I've mentioned, I came from this media background, so my approach in terms of how I try to want to um, to, to deal with this as a, as a field was maybe a wee bit different to other folk. I mean, on, on the one hand, I wanted to do genealogical research for folk, and as I've mentioned already, I tried to sort of go along this idea of projecting the idea that everyone's got a story. That's why I called my, my, my service Scotland's greatest story, you know, because everyone has the greatest story they'll ever have as their own. Um, but I also wanted, I, I think it came from this kind of media background, uh, this idea of trying to share what I knew as well. And it was one of the reasons I set up the, the, the blog that I established was to let people know about news, in particular in, in Scotland and Ireland, because the, the mainstream press at that point, the family history press, was very London-centric, very sort of English-based. And, and often you'd have a one-line comment in the news section about something going on north of the border or whatever. So it was a, a way to try and address that. Um, so I brought something a wee bit different to the, the mix of what was going on at that time in terms of news. And that ended up get me involved with various news columns for magazines and things. Um, but this idea of trying to share what I know as well, I mean, it's interesting when you say you talk about competing against people. It was one of the things I actually felt when I first started as a genealogist for the first couple of years I was actually quite isolated because I did actually think I was competing against other genealogists. And I actually rapidly changed my mind on that. I mean, we ended up, I think a few years, I don't know, maybe about eight years ago, seven years ago, we were down at Who Do You Think You Are Live? And there were other genealogists I was aware of in Scotland that I'd never met. And we decided at one of the Who Do You Think You Are Live events to just meet up for a drink and have a chat. And on the back of that, we realized we actually had a lot in common. We weren't actually competing against each other. And we could actually learn from each other. And that, that's what we, we established a thing um, called the Scottish Genealogy Network in Scotland, where we tried to informally network with each other and, and sort of try and learn from each other. Uh, as well as try and do the work. There's plenty of work out there. You know, you're not actually competing against other genealogists. Um, and that was a, a huge thing for me, was changing my approach from feeling that I was having to compete with people as opposed to trying to work with people. It's a bit like what you're doing now with this event here, this kind of CPD session. Um, but that wasn't something I was aware of when I first started. I actually felt quite isolated, and quite um, alone within the world and thinking that there was something, it was, it was going to be difficult being a one-man band. So again, that was a slight difference of approach that I ended up um, developing. And, I, I, and through the sort of articles and things that I wrote, you know, I was quite happy to share with people what I knew about different records and how to do things and all the rest of it. I know there are some genies who like to portray this kind of almost elitist kind of approach to things, and, and they like to be seen as being the experts and things. I hate the word expert. There's no such thing. You're constantly always learning. You're never going to know everything, you know. So I don't know if that's maybe something that, got recognized and why I was asked to do a bit more in terms of writing and things like that. I mean, I suppose that's ultimately what, you know, for other people to comment as to why I'm still survived as a genealogist today. Um, I don't feel any different to other genealogists. That's the weird thing. I just kind of feel I do what I do. But I, I suppose a lot of that did come from my previous background and I just kind of applied it to what I was doing at the time, you know. Now, this is a fun question. What part of your job do you most enjoy? The research, puzzle solving, the detective work, the writing? The satisfaction of telling the story. Um, so I love doing presentations. I mean, I, I do a lot of talks and things, but more more so overseas and perhaps here over in, in, in the UK. But I, I like getting up in front of a crowd and just having a good laugh. I, I always say to folk, I'm very serious about what I do, but not necessarily the way I do it. And, and I like to have a bit of a laugh when I'm doing talks and, and trying just to help, you know, um, have a bit of fun with the audience and to sort of be with them instead of projecting to them, you know. Um, but similarly with writing and things like that, I, I, you know, there's days I'll sit down and I think, you know, I, I just can't, I'm just not in the mood to do any research today, but I'm going to write one hell of an article. I, I go for it, you know. So it, it's, there's different things that I do. The only thing I wouldn't do um, is probably bizarrely enough is having worked in TV. I, I won't do any TV work. Um, the only times I've ever done sort of TV is maybe the local news if I need to do something within the TV within the news to get um, something announced or, or whatever. But I, I think a lot of people think that they're waiting for their five minutes of fame or 15 minutes of fame on who do you think you are. It is only going to be 15 minutes of a fame. You know, I, I know this, having done this for a living, and um, how disposable that kind of side of things is. 
So, but in terms of the teaching and you know the, the Faros courses I do and and, and the client work, they, they all have their own satisfactions. You know, so they, I, I just love doing it all. You know. And Chris, do you accept research commissions for the other islands, England, Ireland, and Wales, as well as for Scotland and Northern Ireland? Uh, well, in terms of mixing things up, yeah, I do mix it up. I mean, I, I, I do as much writing as I do research and as much presentation, you know, and it, it's just, it's a portfolio existence and that, that's actually deliberate. And the, the first year when I worked as a genealogist, I pretty much concentrated on research and then it got to Christmas and it was quite busy. And then in January, all the work dried up. Everybody had spent their money at Christmas and I realized I couldn't rely on the one thing. So that's why I began to develop this idea of doing different things and having different niches along the way. In terms of specialism, um, I tend to concentrate on Scotland and to some extent Ireland, um, mainly Scotland. I will do research uh, in England and I will do research from Ireland as much as I can do from Scotland. But of course, there are records in Ireland that sometimes you just need someone in Ireland to do the work. Um, I do, because I'm, I'm involved with the, the, the Public Record Office in Belfast, PRONI. I, I go over every three months to the, the user forum meetings. So I will do some client work um, in the afternoons after that meeting, and sometimes I'll do an extra day as well. So I, I do some work over in Belfast, uh, and some I can obviously do online. There are some jobs for Ireland that I just know fine rightly. It's going to need someone in Ireland to do that job, and I will refer that on. Um, so, but, I, but I tend to concentrate mainly on, on Scottish research. Um, I think a lot of people in Scotland think I'm the Irish guy and, and try to throw the Irish problems to me, but most of the work I actually do when it comes to client work is actually Scottish-based client work. Um, and occasionally I'll do English work and even some overseas work. I, I don't try to be an expert in everything, though. I, I try to concentrate on what's on my doorstep because I can go to the archives here in Scotland or I can go down to the north of England or whatever. Um, so, yeah, w within reason, I'll, I'll do some work in other territories, but I, I know what my limits are, I know where I should be based and what I should be doing. And I know there's plenty of good folk in the other parts of the, the British Isles who do an equally good job if, it's need to, if it needs to be done and I can refer it over to them. Lorna, I'm most familiar with your work in the Clans and Names conferences and also from the radio show. So you like to mix it up too, is that right? Oh, I do. I do. I do believe that for any of us to survive in a heavily digitized world, we're going to have to mix it up as genealogists because so many records are coming online all the time. And that if we don't mix it up we, and support each other by spreading work, good quality work around to good quality people, we'll end up dead in the water because never there are nine billion trees online now. And I bet you there's about two billion bits of data that are wrong on those nine billion trees. So um, verification, proper documentation, learning how to work together, learning how to support each other so that we can, like that's why it's so great about the continued professional development in the associate, you know, that that body, that's, that's that part that's been bought in the association Association of Professional Genealogists, because it means that people do have to keep up their skills, do have to mix it up, do have to see where they've got to learn, and so on. I've always found that appealing about the association, the fact that they offered continuous professional development. I have found it frustrating that the continuous professional development seemed to be more geared towards genealogists who were based in on the continental United States, Canada. I found it difficult to try and take that information and make it relevant to me um, or to what it was that I was doing in my practice. You've developed a successful career, both of you in fact, as leading genealogists in your native country. And both of you also have names that are recognised internationally as authorities. Can I ask you, what has been more important in developing this recognition? Is it timing? One of the people on our, on our chat panel has thanked Chris and mentioned that, in fact, Chris was one of the early pioneers. Jane Harris, one of the early pioneers in uh, bringing genealogy online. So was it timing an opportunity, both of you, that you turned professional exactly at the time that genealogy took off as a hobby? Um, is it love of your subject, the sweat of your brow, contacts, talent? Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. It's a mixture of all of those things. And it's the digital revolution that we do. I did a show on that with Brian, Brian at the start of the genealogy radio show. And everything that he said has come about 
you know, like, um, and how we've moved in how being able to converse with each other just like this, this would have been impossible five years ago. Down in Clare, you wouldn't have an internet connection that would be able to support that. So uh, all those kind of things that have happened, happen together all at once. The fact that you can make phone calls through Facebook the fact that you can get a landline, I can ring my clients now. I don't, I, I, there's just so many changes that have happened that have, have made it possible to be a professional genealogist dealing with an international audience at this time. And Chris, what about you? How do you think? I think, well, it's, it's a similar sort of thing. I, in, in Scotland, when I decided I was going to go for it around about 2005, that, that was the time when um, Scotland's people uh, was beginning to kick off. With Scotland I was beginning to develop a reputation at the point of digitising a lot of records and making them fairly easy to access. You just went to Edinburgh and you paid a fee and you got unlimited access to everything. So it became a very viable um, career option. You could go in and actually do a day's work and come out with a product at the end of it. I think the actual the field itself, though, especially here in Scotland, things have changed because it's no longer just about going to the Scotland's People Centre and just looking at lots of names of births, marriages and deaths because it is so accessible now that anyone can do that. I mean, they, they don't need a genealogist to do that. You can save money through a genealogist and so on, but it is possible to do it from your own home. So the actual specialisms and things that I've needed to work on um, have changed over the years. I, don't, I rarely go into a, a, a genealogy centre now and do a day's work creating a family tree from scratch for somebody. A lot of the time now it's about problem solving. And the thing that's enabled me to deal with that has been CPD. It has been constantly, as Lorna says, you've got to keep learning. You've got to keep reading. You've got to keep identifying what you don't know. Um, so that, that to me has been a, 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 a serious part of what I've done the last few years. I mean, a lot of the time when I write books or articles, some of those articles and books, I, I'm having to research things for those articles. So I'm learning. I'm forcing myself to learn. Um, similarly with the, the, the blog that I established um, a few years ago, it wasn't just about sharing news, it was also about providing an archive for me and, and keeping me up to date with things that were happening in the world. So you've got to keep on top of things, you've got to keep on top of um, the way the, the profession is moving, and you've got to be aware of what's happening within the world. Um, but at the same time, it is all the other things that you know that you mentioned earlier on, it is about, you've got to have fun with it, you've got to put a bit of hard work into it, um, you know, you've got to be aware of things like social media and all that kind of thing. But above all, I, th I think what you also have to do is you also have to be very honest about what you do and try and share what you can with people. Make yourself an accessible person. Make yourself somebody somebody wants to hire, you know. Um, and that's as much about how you project yourself. Um, and, I mean, there is a, a saying I used to have as well. When we worked in TV, they always said to you, you're only as good as your last job. And you've also got to be aware that you are only as good as your last job. You know, if you get one thing wrong and you screw up and it becomes a big public screw up, that could affect your next commission and so on. So you do have to kind of um, keep on top of your game uh, and, and keep up to date with things. You, you can do courses at universities or you can do hobby courses or whatever, but ultimately when you've passed those courses, you've got your qualification. They're only assessing what you did at that time. Um, and as you move away from having completed your university course, or whatever, you know, that that's just an assessment from a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. You've got to keep learning and keep improving you again. There's very many more courses now than there were even five years ago. Um, I'm teaching two during the week. I know Lorna has been continuously associated with the uh, UCC course for the last four years. Um, and Chris, you've also been involved in the University of Strathclyde course as well as teaching on Ferris. And um, this brings me to another interesting um, thing I find about both of you. You both have it in common. Academic accreditation is very important to you. You both have postgraduate qualifications in your field. What role do you see for universities as genealogy, family history becomes more professional? When I did my, my postgraduate course, it, I actually very much saw it not a, a, a need that I had for an academic qualification. I saw it as a vocational qualification. I, it's the reason why I did two years at university. I didn't go on to do a master's or a, you know, a PhD or whatever after that. Um, I did two years because I had training that I needed to address. So I, I, I think a lot of people go for it because they, they want an academic qualification. I already had an academic qualification. I had a degree from another university. So it was more about trying to up my game and, and fulfill sort of gaps in my knowledge and so on. I think university courses, they, they project a standard 
and they do force you to think in a different way, perhaps get away from this kind of obvious thing of doing your own family tree. They make you realize there are structures and things out there you need to be aware of. Um, but as I said, you know, as I say, they, they are only part of the story. Once you've got your qualification, it doesn't give you the right to put yourself up on a pedestal and tell everyone you're qualified. It just means you've reached another stage of your career, but you still have more to go. And I can't emphasize enough, you've got to keep learning about things. Even when you finished your studies, you've got to keep reading, you've got to keep training um, and learning from mistakes and so on. Um, so as I say, I, I always saw it as a more vocational thing. Uh, but, you know, the, the, there's a role out there for, for academic genealogy. There's a role out there for uh, vocational training. Um, and I suppose it's what you want out of it when, when you go to do the courses. It's what you can take away with it, uh, take away from it uh, at the end of it. Sure, but it's good when you see an academic credential, something which has been examined by a university, there is a, a level of trust there. You know that somebody has actually achieved a certain basic standard before they've even started. That's what those letters after their name means. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just, I'm just saying that I think from your own point of view, I, I think if you go away with the qualification and you have the letters at the end of your name, I don't think that you then can say to yourself, that's great, I'm now recognised authority about the letters after my name. Other people will see that as a, as a badge of trust and something they can go towards. Um, similarly, um, it, not necessarily just um, a, a, a degree or a postgraduate qualification, if you've been accredited by one of the societies as well, I mean, it fulfills a similar purpose. Um, but in terms of your personal thinking about what it is that you do, once you've got that course or that qualification and you've got those letters, that's not the end of the game. You still need to keep training, even if there's no more letters to be had. And you still need to keep reading because you can only do so much in two years and there's so much more out there that you haven't learned yet. And um, so, you know, I, I, I would absolutely encourage people to go and do one of these courses, but just to see it as part of the journey and not, and not be all and end all of your sort of training needs, really. I do think it's part of the journey and I do very much get the thing that you have to keep on learning that uh, all a degree course or a postgraduate qualification will give you is a bit of time to engage in directed learning under somebody's uh, supervision and um, maybe to read, um, to read, to focus in and read on particular aspects. Nonetheless, I do think, I do think that as we've seen genealogy changing and becoming more professional. I think that is really our entry point now, surely, isn't it? Would be precisely having that qualification from a university. And the surety that only a university can give because it's only a university that has objective standards that are that are applied in the same way with external examiners and a chance to audit as and when. That's something that a society can never actually replicate. No, there is a value in that. I, I, I suspect a lot of people might disagree with you, though, who have maybe been working as genealogists for 20 years, 30 years, and haven't got a degree or a postgraduate qualification. No, they, they do have other areas of expertise um, and things they can bring to the party. It is becoming a more recognised um, uh, and important entry point. Um, I, I'm, I question whether it's the only entry point. That's the only thing I'm saying. That's curious to say that. Lorna, what's your thinking on this? My thinking of the recognition of prior learning is that, yes, we have a way of recognizing it now. So that's something that is the failure of the course if it's, it's not the failure of the person applying. I mean, if someone has 25 years experience in genealogy, there, there, there usually is a section in a good course provider that will give a recognition what's known as RPL a recognition of prior learning. And I think that's where the CPD, the continued professional development of the Association of Professional Geolo Genealogists is so valuable because there's many courses I, I want to develop that include the APG's continued professional development because I think it's become a very, very strong body to prove that there is a recognition of prior learning amongst its members. You know, a degree is only as good as the practice that's based around it um, and the best degrees are challenged and looked at and verified on a continual basis. Um, many professional bodies have big inputs now into universities because of the clout they bring to a certain area of expertise and it's something that's become looked for more and more. I would say that the American universities 
have a great handle on that, as does Strathclyde. I would say that they've been at that to to realise that they, 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 they've incorporated it into their learning outcomes. And it's something maybe Ireland has adapted to late, but is coming on in leaps and bounds. So it's not a criticism so much as just an observation, you know, that this recognition of prior learning for me would be essential as I go to local experts or areas of local expertise. I wouldn't dream of going to a location without checking out who knows what's going on in that place. I wouldn't take it on myself to go up to the north of Ireland as I have done on a number of occasions without contacting those that are in the know in that place. Okay, interesting. So in a sense, you're saying acknowledge the, the experience that at, at some particular point in time, the level of experience can be, you believe, maybe equivalent to what can be learned in a degree. I think immediately of a couple of speakers I'd love, to, speakers. I'd love to bring on that would generate uh, quite an interesting discussion. Can you, Chris? One or two. <laughs> <laughs> Well, genealogy has transformed in the last 10 years. It's gone from being a cottage industry, I think, to an industry proper. And there's also very many more practicing paid genealogists, not simply hobbyists. Can I ask both of you, what do you think are the biggest changes that have occurred in genealogy? And a follow on question, do you think all the changes have been positive ones? I think some of the changes have been negative. I think the well, the lack of requirement in genealogists to be accountable, uh, holding correct insurances, indemnity, all that needs to be stepped up to the plate because there's just too much damage can be done if you turn around, especially in an adoption space or in a in a space of sensitive where sensitivity is required, just to pass the buck and just give them the address of where they need to look up someone and that there's no accountability on what what damage that information could do to someone if they're not prepared for it and so on and i would say that that's the case in in facebook and bits and pieces that a lack of training or a lack of accountability could really be quite a savage you know it's easy to say things and do things but to be accountable is another matter on a professional basis you know, isn't that a problem in the bigger in the in the? It's a problem that we have on a day to day basis. How do we actually regulate social media and in particular Facebook? Everyone seems to be forever complaining about Facebook, but I have seen things which shouldn't have been published and which it wouldn't take a child of ten to assess that those things should in fact have been removed. So you're saying that these same problems with social media trolling and the like can actually also have a grave effect if you're looking if you're dealing with something like an adoption case issues of illegitimacy most definitely because what we've got as we've got another mixture to this now we've got an easier way of finding this information with dna as well so every component of how data is relayed and regulated i suppose that could cause harm to a person has to be looked at but it's not happening at the moment. There isn't a there isn't a central body that's kind of examining the data and how it's being relayed and what the rules are. There's decency and there's personal ethics. But I suppose what we need to do is be aware that this data is suddenly becoming we're in an information rich environment and we can have all the information we want. But how we govern it is another matter. And I do believe that this is a. Uh, a wider issue. For example, there have been many scandals lately that would have taken 20 years to get to the courts, but can actually change someone's life within two or three days now. And I know that Chris would be a better expert on how to evaluate this than I would have with his experience of media. But it's something that I'm very aware of and something that um, ethically I'd like an arm on continue on continued professional development in APG to address it, given the fallout of what can happen. Can I ask you to outline in the broadest terms what exactly kind of what kind of scandal now without naming names or pinning anything, but what are you talking about exactly? I'm not au fait with what you're what you mean. 
I'm talking about public figures where we have scandals in public figures and it happens every day of the week. It wouldn't necessarily mean be, be a genealogical framework, but we can see by example how quickly it can take root through social media. Are you and talking about sexual harassment? Yes, I am. I am talking about that. And I'm talking about the speed at which that toxic type of, type of masculinity you know, I'm not com coming from an opinionated place. I'm coming from the speed at which that goes around the world. For example, when Kurt Cobain died, it took a lot longer to hit the world than what it does when when uh, someone else dies. You know, so we're, 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 our information is coming to us faster. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a danger attached to it. And that's true for genealogy remits as well. Um, I remember years, a few years ago, there was a series the BBC put together called Gene Detectives, and you you literally had a person coming in who had to do a DNA test, and then three women were brought into a studio, and one of those women was going to turn out to be his mm -hmm. mother, um, and it it was the most unethical thing. It's the only time I've ever complained to the BBC about a, a program. Um, was this idea that they turned it into a game show? One of you is, is going to be, it's going to turn out to be this guy's mum. And I, I know the other day, for example, there's there's a program I think starting, um, I think it's a channel called W, and I, I forget the title of it. It's a DNA series, but I, I saw the blurb for it a few days ago, and I, I deliberately didn't put it on my blog, so I want to see it first. And it was about how to to unearth the secrets of a person through this wonderful thing of DNA. And I thought we don't have the right to unearth the secrets of somebody. If they're secrets, they're secrets for a reason, you know. Um, so I want to see the program first and see whether it's just a very bad line they've used to promote it. But there's a, there, on the ethical side of things, I mean, there's all sorts of issues to do with ethics. I, mean, I, I have a real problem with the way ancestry is portraying the ethnicity side of things with DNA, for example. And I was in um, Australia uh, about two months ago, and there's a, a wonderful genealogist called Dirk Weisleder who was talking to me, he's German, he was talking to me about how in Germany they're absolutely uh, against DNA um, as, a, as a tool, or at least his understanding of it within the genealogy world there was that DNA is something they're very, very against. And it's this idea that ethnicity is the last thing they want to be proclaiming to the world about through their experiences before the Second World War when you had to prove your Aryan connections and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, I remember that when I was um, watching uh, an American channel a couple of uh, weeks ago, and uh, Ancestry had an advert on about DNA and, and somebody said, I've just done my test and I discovered I'm Scottish so I can hang up my later rows and, and now buy a kilt. And I, my heart sank. <laughs> um, so I, th I think there's lots of issues to do with ethics that I think some of the big players need to look at as well. And because the thing they're trying to market things on aren't necessarily what's actually appropriate for, for genealogists. I mean, we're interested in, in cousin connecting and things like that. Um, and some of the stuff that's being portrayed is just bubblegum, you know. Um, so the, 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 there have been some sort of big issues that have arisen over the last few years as this has become a bigger industry. But there's been a lot of positive things that have happened too. So, um, it, you know, things are changing by the day, though. But it's something we all need to keep an eye on. It's just, you know, what it is we do and how it affects others. That's really interesting. You both identified really ethics, ethics. ethics as some of the key issues potential problems that have arisen with changes in technology. One of the key drivers of that, of course, is social media. Can I ask you both, because both of you are very active in social media, does it potentially offer a shortcut to genealogists who are newly entering the industry? I like social media and I like what it does. I like being able to connect the Facebook groups are absolutely fantastic and they're not necessarily public. They're private, you know, and they have membership and they do have rules about how you post and so on. So I have I have um, found the groups, though, to be so helpful, especially for the genealogy radio show in, in, in sourcing correct data and information and bits and pieces. So I do believe social media is not all bad. I just believe that for some issues, it can be dangerous not to realize that there are people behind things. And I really like what Chris had to say about the show and the bits and pieces that somebody who isn't a genealogist may be involved in production or involved in something. So that's where the issue lies, that they may not be aware of certain components. And it's up to us as a professional body to make them aware with all the training and with all the, the, the kind of educating that we do, you know. 
And Chris, what do you think about social media? Is there anything that you would ever not include in your blog or anyone that you would not include in your blog and for what reasons? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, it, it just basic things. You would never libel anybody, you would never, you know, I mean, um, standards of decency and language and things like that. I mean, to me, social media, for, for all the hype there is around it, um, and I do a lot of work with social media, but it is just another form of communication. Um, the ability to talk with people online is, is just another form of being able to talk. I mean, one, one of the things I, I find interesting was that when, when I did the postgraduate course in Glasgow, it, 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 for the first couple of years, um, which is when I, I did the course, it was actually an attendance-based course. And it's now an online taught course, and there's nothing wrong with that. It, 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 it's, you know, it gets to people across the world and so on. But by being an attendance-based course, there's people I met you know, 10 years ago who I now trust implicitly as genealogists, and I know that if I've got a problem, I can go to them because um, I know what they can do, and, and we've met and we've socialized and all that kind of stuff. So you can communicate with people online, but to the extent where you just exclude everyone else, you can't just create a way into the industry by being very good on Twitter or being very good on Facebook. You, it, it's just a, a, another platform and another way. It, it doesn't matter which platforms you use. It's whether you've actually got something worthwhile to say. Um, that's just as important whether you're just talking to somebody or whether you do it online. Um, there's a lot of people who've got a voice and a lot of people who've got a Twitter account. And you'll just be another voice in the crowd if you're, if you're just um, part of a wider chorus. You need to have something specific you want to say through these platforms to, to be heard. And um, so basically what makes you listen to through the platforms is how you use it and, and what you can offer that's different to what other people might do. We don't have the same reputation in Ireland or in the UK, I think, for entrepreneurship as they do in the US. And yet both of you have built careers, partly by doing something that nobody else was doing before you. You really are pioneers. Also by doing it differently or better. Can I ask you both, Lorna, first of all, you, do you see yourself as an entrepreneur? Not really. No, I would have just seen, seen that. I would be very good at at starting projects and then maybe it's time to hand them over. Like that is a gift that I have, you know, that I would be excellent at starting major projects and then handing them on. And that's that's a role that I've learned to be happy with, that I've learned that I, I don't have to be always successful at completing a project that I can be successful at getting it up and running and then putting it into a stable position for something else. So entrepreneurship would probably maybe a little bit entrepreneurship, but, but I, I would kind of think that it's, it's very historically based rather than business based to a certain extent. I probably could be doing things better. You know, so I'd often see as entrepreneurs being very successful and bits and pieces. There's been many things that I failed at and I've learned through those failures, if you know what I mean. So um, I, in leading, I often I'm not afraid to take risks. And that's something that is, is something that that I think you do need in in this line of work, because there are so many new challenges coming. I suppose in the sense I'm taking that idea of an entrepreneur and its widest interpretation, uh, not simply as a business person, but as somebody who uh, maybe has a new idea of how something can be done in a different way, and um, hopefully sometimes in a better way. Chris, do you see yourself as an entrepreneur in family history? Uh, no, I'm just a desperate husband and a parent with two kids to feed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, no, I don't at all. I, there's plenty of people out there doing really good stuff. Um, I, I just might be loud, you know, but I might just have a funny accent that gets picked up on. The only thing I've been entrepreneurial about is trying to change my own life in terms of, the, the, you know, moving away from a, a setup where I used to work for people in a structured hierarchy and, and going into self-employment mode and all that kind of thing. But, you know, I think people still want to read articles I write and they still want to buy the books. And, and, and if that helps, that, that's great. But there's plenty of other people doing it as well. I, I'm just another cog in the old machine, I think, you know, so. It's, these kind of things are absolutely fantastic and, and uh, they're wonderful because we, we've, we've learned, I've new, I learn new skills every day and now I've learned about go to meeting, which I really like. And um, <laughs> just that, that we all, that we're not afraid to embrace all these kind of changes that are coming about and that we do these things an awful lot more often. We check out Google Hangout. We check out all the free things we could be using to liaise with each other. I'm fascinated with the increasing growing membership of the Association of Professional Genealogists. I'd love to get over to the States to give a paper for them and, and, and you know, 
learn the importance, make people realize the importance of surnames because it's the only thing we often have, especially if you're looking at historical facts that are dispossession and, and things like that, that um, it's the only key we have to the past. So basically that, that that's really all I have to say on it that, and, and uh, I'm pretty much talked out. I think for me, uh, where do you get ideas from? And desperation. I think there's a lot of things, you know, I, I tend to come up with ideas for things when, when things are not quite working out and I try to find other ways forward. But a lot of that comes through CPD when I'm reading stuff and I think oh, that's really interesting. What can I do with that? Well, I might be able to apply it to this. I might even get an article out of it. But so I, I do force myself to keep reading on stuff and that sometimes generates ideas for, for books or articles and things like that. I also have a few ideas for things. I mean, I'm always aware that this is a really weird industry, particularly when you're in a kind of a sort of portfolio sort of existence like I've got. I mean, when I write for magazines, for example, if those magazines go out of business overnight, that can be a sudden drop in income. So I need to have something to slot into this place. So I've got a few things, obviously, that I always have sort of in the pipeline that I know I can turn my idea to or turn my attention to if that sort of happens. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of where you get ideas, you just get your ideas from talking to people and from things you read and, and for, you know, oh, it, people, yeah. even project work you've done for people, you know. I'm going to finish with a quick fire round. Can we have short answers for this? Lorna and Chris, genealogy or family history? Oh, family, family history. history. Heraldry, an art or a science? Heraldry. A science. Chris? Uh, neither. It's just another science. source with its own language, you know. Okay. Tartan or plaid? Uh, shortbread. Um, ben Sinister or Ben Dexter? Dexter. Oh, I would say Sinister, because I'm both lefty and I'm equally Sinister. <laughs> we are going to finish it there. Uh, we've been on for an hour. I've asked the questions that came up in the chat box as they came up. So can I say just once again, thank you to our two speakers, to Chris Payton and to Lorna Maloney. Thank you for coming on today. Um, thank you once again. We rely on your feedback, so please do let us know if uh, do let us know how you actually found this conversation, whether you found it useful, and if you want more. We have one more trial discussion scheduled, but I really want to hear back. I want to hear your feedback, everyone who is here today. So thank you very much.